Have you got any advice for maybe researchers in the university? Only in this way, when we're looking at all the different fields and disciplines, will we be able to make effective change. Lovely to meet you. So I'm Isha, I'm the co-president of the Oxford Climate Society and I'm also an undergraduate biology student. Well, great to meet you. I'm uh, Paul Shearing. I am director of the Zero Institute for Zero Carbon Energy Research. And I'm also a professor in engineering. My chair is in sustainable energy engineering. Could you tell me a bit of a brief overview of what your personal research is? Most of my research is in energy storage. So I have the very good fortune to lead a large research team here in Oxford, mostly looking at different types of battery chemistries for lots of different applications, whether that's electric vehicles, whether that's grid scale energy storage. And it's brilliant to be doing it in Oxford because, as you may know, o Oxford is home to the lithium ion battery. It was invented here in Oxford in the 1970s. So delighted to be continuing that long tradition of battery research here in Oxford. Do you think batteries are going to be the way that we can sort of bridge renewable energy with the systems that we have in place already with fossil fuel infrastructure? Yeah, I mean, energy storage is going to be absolutely central to how we navigate the energy transition, particularly when we think about resilience, because, I mean, everyone knows the wind doesn't always blow, the sun doesn't always shine, um, and that means that we need to have some form of energy storage that's going to enable us to balance that inherent intermittency in renewable energy generation. Uh, Isha, what, what are you studying? So I study biology. I'm in my third year of the undergraduate degree. And what, is your interest in climate change a direct influence on why you chose to study biology in the first place? I guess so. I think my favourite module that I'm doing right now is conservation, ecosystems and sustainable development. We have a guest lecture from Kate Rayworth actually looking at donut economics and we're sort of considering the climate nature nexus and how biodiversity also needs to be addressed with our decarbonisation goals. Do you think that there's a sort of way of navigating that consistently so we get all of those co-benefits across uh, you know Im improving climate improving biodiversity reducing our admissions I think this is where climate in the education system is so important and that we need to understand climate as something that isn't its own separate scientific entity and it's something that influences and impacts everything. So if we sort of have a historical understanding of how our relationship with the land changed over time with enclosures, that will sort of impact the way that we look at agriculture. And I guess if we think about climate in terms of the green markets, carbon markets and bioeconomy, we look at how that can influence where we put the sovereignty of our currency. It, only in this way, when we're looking at all the different fields and disciplines, will we be able to make effective change. And how upscalable do you think renewable energy is? Because I guess we also have to use the finite resource that is lithium, and then that becomes a problem when we're looking at producing things in mass quantities. So I think for all of the future energy technologies, whether that's uh, solar PV, whether that's batteries, whether that's wind farms, we have a real responsibility to think about the circular economy. Um, when we're navigating the energy transition, of course we want to get these zero carbon energy systems up and running to meet our targets, both morally and in the case of the UK, legally binding targets. But we need to do that responsibly as well. And so understanding where the raw materials that go into batteries or solar cells, for example, come from, how we can make sure that there is stewardship across all of the supply chain, that those supply chains are sustainable, responsible, ethical, is really important. Can I ask about how the work at the Zero Institute sort of works within the Just Energy Transition framework? The Just Energy Transition, I think, it has to be just an underpinning philosophy of everything we do. I think it's you know, intrinsically woven through the work that we do. We know that there is a pathway to net zero. We know that energy uh, supply can improve quality of life. And we really need to be working with stakeholders internationally to make sure that we're responsibly navigating the energy transition globally. And I guess, yeah, globally, we now know that renewables have overtaken coal as sort of the biggest generator of electricity. What role do you think hydrogen energy is going to play in sort of continuing this trend? Hydrogen is a hugely important energy vector for the energy transition. Um, and there's lots of different flavours. Sometimes people call them colours of hydrogen. So we might have uh, green hydrogen, which could be made through electrolysis. So we feed in renewable um, uh, electricity to a, for example, a polymer electrolyte electrolyzer, and that will make green hydrogen, which is wonderful. It means that we've got very little embedded carbon in that hydrogen. Of course, there are different approaches, blue hydrogen, gray hydrogen, where there's more of an associated uh, carbon footprint. We also have the emergence of gold hydrogen, where that's natu naturally occurring reservoirs of hydrogen that people are increasingly uh, searching for. 
we talked briefly before about energy storage and at really large scale, hydrogen is a very compelling opportunity because if we take a wind farm, for example, where we've got oversupply, which, which does happen, we can use that opportunity to actually generate large quantities of green hydrogen that can be stored, for example, in underground salt caverns and actually can be stored for really quite long periods of time at really large scale. But in addition to energy storage, hydrogen is going to play a, a, a massive role in decarbonising feedstocks for a whole range of different industries. I think that part of the energy transition is recognising we need a portfolio of technologies, so energy storage in batteries, but also energy storage and conversion via hydrogen is, is absolutely going to be central to that portfolio. Do you think there's a lot of climate anxiety around? I think, I do think so, and I think this is in a large part perpetuated by sort of the doom and gloom in the media. I personally, I would look at the climate news and you see the big pictures of the wildfires and um, flooding and you sort of just feel very hopeless and very scared and I think that's, that's what I found a lot of other young people have said. And actually for me, I learned that it wasn't about trying to solve these massive grand scale problems. It was about looking at my local area, what can I do to make a difference? You just have to remain hopeful but actively hopeful fight the anxiety by just doing your little bit and speaking to people who also are because that's I guess that's what helps and that's how we can make the change. Do you think that there's a lot of misinformation out there that is driving climate anxiety? There probably is a misinformation problem but I think there's also an accessibility problem in that people don't know what's going on and they're not hopeful because they're very much stuck in the mindset of oh this is a huge problem and there's nothing that we can do about it whereas actually there's a lot of progress being made I mean even with you in the Zero Institute everything you've told me is very optimistic and I think I think it's just a case of people aren't realizing what's going on. And so obviously some of the activities that you're doing in the Climate Society is translating some of that scientific understanding for a, for a broader audience. Have you got any advice for maybe researchers in the university in terms of how we can do better at promoting that message of optimism, that message of hope? I think an important thing to do is just involve people and um, make young people aware of what's going on. I think a lot of us have often felt quite excluded from these spaces. Bringing young people into these spaces and into these conversations would be great and just making us aware that there is all of this going on out there and that it is something that we can definitely engage with. Amazing. Th thanks so much for the opportunity to have this conversation today. I've enjoyed it tremendously. Thank, Thank you. you. It was really lovely to meet you too.